Hello, everyone. My name is Louisa Morse. I am the division chair of STR, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event on the relevance of formal theoretical work and strategy. This event is the first in a series we will, we will be running this academic year on the impact and relevance of strategic management, hence the background on impact and relevance. In many of the events like the one today, the sessions will involve conversations with strategy practitioners, uh, and I'm sure we're gonna have an interesting conversation. So thank you very much to the panelists for being here and participating, and also to my co-organizer, Kroon Heimerich, for helping uh, organizing this event. I'm gonna hand out to Kroon now to introduce the event and today's speakers. Thank you so much, Louise, wonderful. Um, also on, be on my behalf, a great welcome to our panelists, to our participants, it's wonderful to have you here. And hopefully this is gonna be enriching experience for you uh, as a SDR member. And Louise, wonderful. Thank you for the support and and and, and making this happen. You know, as uh, as our STR division chair. So um, I'm Kuhn Heimrichs. I'm the STR uh, executive uh, committee member who's organizing uh, together with Louise the event. Our panel contributors of today are Christina Fung, who's professor of management and organizations at NUI Stern. We have Martin Reeves as a second speaker, who's the chairman of the BCG Henderson Institute, the think tank at BCG. We have uh, Mike Ryle, who's a professor of strategic management at uh, Toronto. And we have Fibo Wibbins, who is assistant professor at INSEAD and our 2023 SDR Emerging Scholar winner. Um, so it's uh, wonderful to, uh, to once again, to welcome you all. Uh, this is uh, part of a series of virtual events that STR is organizing that we're offering for our members. The events are recorded um, and posted on our YouTube channel, uh, which we invite you to, uh, to visit. Uh, should you be interested in watching many more uh, of the events that we organize for you. Today's session is obviously one's, uh, one in a series, uh, and it's the first uh, on, on rigor and relevance, uh, which is particularly organized around the relevance of theoretical work and strategy, as we just kindly announced. The key intent for the session is to explore new ideas and thinking into the relevance of formal theory. Um, you know, just as a little backdrop, right, there's an interesting tension, I think, in our field going on. On the one hand, we have formal theory and rigorous methods and econometrics becoming more and more important. At the same time, there is a big push for relevance in our scholarly work. Um, this is what this very session is about. How do we morph those two together? And should we uh, or should we not you know, be pursuing that? Today's panel will discuss these important questions. Each panelist has 12 to 15 minutes to present, uh, after which we'll do a Q&A. Uh, you can obviously post any questions meanwhile you have in the chat box, so please make use of that if you would. Uh, and uh, I will be keeping the time. And uh, without further ado, Christina, can I invite you to uh, to open up and uh, share your thoughts with us, please? Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers for the invitation. And let me start. So the title of my quick talk today is the relevance of formal theoretical work in strategy. And if the answer, if the question is, is it relevant, then the answer is absolutely yes. One does not need to go further than the classic work published by Jim March in 1991, titled The Exploration Exploitation in Organization Learning, to have a great example of impactful and relevant uh, theoretical work in management. As you can see here at the bottom, it has been cited by over 32,000 articles. So clearly has made a lot of impact in our field. The basic idea of, of the paper is this introduction of this fundamental trade-off between exploration and exploitation into the management literature. So although exploitation, right, as as you can see here, is hitting the uh, the nail at the head, right? It's considered exploitation. While it yields more certain and immediate returns, it makes a discovery of truly novel solutions um, very unlikely and can lead to obsolescence in the long run. And this is an idea that has been put forward by Holland in 1992. So Jim really introduced this idea to the management literature, and he argued that while exploration can enable the discovery of profoundly novel solutions, it has also it also typically can cause a degradation of performance in the short run because searches for novel solutions usually fail, right? So exploration into outer space, into other galaxies, unlikely to yield immediate benefits and yet may be crucial for the long-term survival of our species. So given this 
intriguing idea that is so fundamental to a lot of what we are uh, thinking about in the management literature. March, Jim March basically operationalized these two concepts in very innovative ways. So he operationalized exploitation as learning fast, right? The speed of learning is very fast. You copy best performing ideas very efficiently, very quickly, very efficiently, right? But that could lead to premature convergence on the homogeneous set of ideas and therefore lower overall performance. Exploration, he operationalized as learning slow, right? slow learning, very inefficiently learning uh, the best performing ideas. This actually counterintuitively allows the organization to preserve more diversity of individual ideas and therefore can lead to higher overall performance in the long run. So these ideas can clearly have been highly impactful and March really used a very simple and yet a very formal model to illustrate some of these ideas and has made a lot of uh, important, um, so, you know, has made a lot of important subsequent work possible. So what is uh, theory? What is formal theory and what is good formal theory? I'm going to use two quick examples to um, just give some preliminary uh, answers. I'm going to use the map of New York City as well as this uh, book cover. Uh, this is a book written by um, Leif and March in 1975 called The Introduction to Models in the Social Sciences. I'm going to use these two examples to illustrate my tentative answers. So as you can see here, this is a map uh, of subway system in New York City, right? I'm going to ask all of you, in what sense this is a good map? Maybe pause for one minute, okay? Oh, one, or maybe one second, okay? How, in what sense this is a good map? Well, it is a good map because it tells you how to get from point A to point B if you need to take the subway, right? What line, what, what number subway you need to take and what roughly you, what, what are the areas that you can get to? So in that sense, it's a very good concise map that tells you how to uh, take the subway systems uh, or use the subway systems in New York City. My second question is, in what sense is this a bad map? Okay, it is a bad map because it doesn't tell you everything you need to know, right? So if you, let's say you wanna go from point A to point B in New York City, this map only tells you how to get there roughly by the subway. What if you need to walk? What if you need to take the buses? What, 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 what if you need to uh, take the cab, right? So the, the map is not detailed enough to tell you everything that you need to know in order to move from point A to point B in New York City. So in that sense, it is a very bad map. All models and all theories are just like maps. They are most useful when they contain the details of interest and deliberately ignore others. So in that sense, models contain very simplified, very abstractive features of reality known as small worlds. Okay. So to, to give you an example, this, are, this is the two characters talking to one another in one of the famous uh, children's book. One character said, well, we actually made a map of the country on the scale of one mile to one mile. And I inquired, have you ever used it much? It has not been spread out yet, right? The farmers objected. They said that it would cover the entire country and shut out the sunlight. Okay, so it's not a map if it's, it's not useful as a map if it's one mile to one mile. In other words, if it's an exact replica of a reality, that's not gonna be useful at all, right? Because it doesn't help us anyway, right? if it's, it's co as complex as reality itself. So formal theories and formal models are not meant to be exact replicas of reality. They rather, they help us understand reality by breaking re reality down one piece at a time. Right? So simple models never really come close to capturing all the important details of the real world. Okay, So in that sense, all models are, by definition, wrong. Right? And yet they provide internally consistent formal account of what could explain the observation of interest. And they help us think about the problem, to get a point across, to communicate what we are thinking, and no model is exact. Right. So I made a point that Models are not, by definition, bad, bad models of reality because they cannot capture everything that is relevant in reality. Now, what is good model then? Uh, I'm going to use this book uh, to draw from this book and give you some quick ideas. So according to Leif and March, a good a model, a, a good model is um, 
is basically a broad and powerful statement about the world, right? It needs to be simple, elegant, and provocative. So here I'm using the word, the words model, model, uh, theory, framework, and ideas very much interchangeably. Okay, so this book, I really think that um, it should be a one semester study of any PhD <laughs> student education, okay? Um, but it also proposes a process model of how do we build theory? How do we build good models? So note the first step here. The first step of any theory building is observation, right? Is observing some empirical facts, empirical regularities that you try to explain. Right. Only after you make those observations, then you motivate your entire theory building exercise. Okay, then you ask yourself, what unknown process or model could have produced these facts, these empirical regularities? Can you deduce other end results from the model? Are there other implications? Uh, if not, can we produce a new model? And in the end, we're on the generalized. This is a very good process model of theory building. So I'm going to give you two examples here, and I highly encourage everyone to try these yourself, right, by following the steps here and try this yourself offline. So for example, take the empirical observation of uh, that, that I took from the book, okay? Automobile drivers rarely smile. If you study the faces of drivers as they pass, you see an unrelieved th series of somber people, right? This is an empirical observation. And what theory and what model can you propose to explain this? Right? And if you follow all the steps that I highlighted before in the last slide, what can you come up with? And next exercise, and the second exercise is most people respect doctors more than lawyers. Why do you think could explain? Why, why, what do you think could be a model that can explain this particular empirical regularity? Right? So there are hundreds and hundreds of examples from the book. Highly encourage everyone to do that uh, in the end, okay? Uh, offline. So I think I'm made the point uh, clear that formal th theories are by definition relevant, right? They're motivated because uh, they're at the very beginning, they're motivated from empirical observation. So they are relevant to an empirical regularity and yet they do not seek to replicate reality, right? So there's a limit as to any single model, any single uh, theory can do because it cannot capture by definition everything that is important about the reality. So in the remaining, uh, two or three minutes, I'm going to use a good example from my own work just because I know them better. I'm going to use my own draw from my own work to illustrate this process of theory building. As I mentioned before, the classic paper by March 1991 is really uh, highlighting the, the, the trade-off between expert and expectation. And in particular, he zoomed in on the speed of learning as a potential lever that organizations can use to tune the balance between expert and expectation, right? High speed of learning, fast speed of learning is, an ex is, is, an, is a proxy for exploitation, and low, slow speed of learning is a proxy for exploration. So then we can ask, what are some of the other features of organizational life empirically observed that could influence the relative balance between exploration and exploitation? So that's a question that I ask in, in several other papers together with my uh, co-authors. So if you go to the March model, you know that a feature of that model is that individuals only learn directly from the code and not from one another. So we all learn individually from our from the code and not from one another. But that's not uh, uh, you know quite realistic if you think about empirically, right? We, empirically, we all learn uh, intuitively from our friends, from other uh, similar situated individuals, and maybe not so much from the code. Uh, okay. So what can we do? So can, can we incorporate this particular feature, this particular empirical, um, empirically realistic feature into the March model and see whether you know any difference can be made? So we basically get rid of the organizational code and then allow individuals who previously cannot learn from one another now the ability to learn individually from each other. So once you allow for individuals uh, to learn from e each other, then the interaction pattern and the communication pattern, their connection pattern matters. So in two related papers, I study how these kind of patterns influence organizational learning, very much similar, very much, you know, just introducing this network connection pattern to the basic uh, March model. So in this paper published in 2010, we ask our, you know, cross-group linkage, 
group for group for organizational learning. If you think about individuals are situated in groups, and each group has sometimes sparse links with one other groups, we find that a small number of cross group links, as you can see, these are red links, are actually going to be the best perform. Uh, um, actually going to be associated with the highest levels of performance because they really allow you to uh, capitalize on the learning within each cave, but also allow you to access distant ideas from other parts of the organization. And very much similarly, um, in the paper published two, four, years, uh, four years later, we broadened the kind of uh, network connection patterns from um, sort of uh, uniform distribution of links to more uh, you know, varied distribution of links. Some networks, some organizations could have uh, very democratic distribution of links, links. Some other organizations may be dominated by a few connected individuals that are, that are hubs, okay? So we study sort of if you can tune this um, by one parameter and then generate a variety of different network patterns, what's going to be the most best performing uh, network pattern. And we find that is neither the hobby networks nor the democratic networks is some kind of in between again, moderately connected hobby networks perform the best, right? So these are two uh, very quick examples of how we can build on the classic March model by introducing sort of realistic features of organizations that we observe in reality and make the models much more convincing and much more uh, persuasive as well. So I'd like to end my quick presentation by saying that building formal model theories, models slash theories uh, is actually very fun. And I highly encourage everyone uh, to take this book seriously. It's an old book uh, and really take the, you know, do the exercises and really learn from the, from the, from the, you know, very, uh, from this sort of set, set of very, uh, create very, uh, fundamental and yet uh, beautiful and fun ideas. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions later on, okay? Thank you so much, Christina. That, that, was, that was wonderful. Thank you for, for, uh, for sharing your thoughts and for you know, linking it so nicely to some of uh, you know, this wonderful foundational work um, and, uh, and your thoughts on formal theory. Let's move to, uh, to Martin if we, if, if we could. Uh, can you hear me okay? Good. Um, well, thank you for inviting me, uh, sort of a pseudo-practitioner, to give a perspective on this question. I say pseudo-practitioner because I, I'm in a consulting company, but I, I do research uh, in, in uh, BCG uh, in order to anticipate new theories and, and issues that clients may need. Um, I actually find this question very strange, and the fact that we're even asking it, let alone holding a session on it, I think it says something about the field. And I mainly want to explore what does it say about the field. Um, uh, Clayton Christensen, I think uh, uh, an influential theoretician on, on practitioners, uh, said in a, a meeting I attended of his in uh, IMD a few years ago, um, that managers are voracious consumers of theory. There, there is no, in the, in the practice of strategy, there is no separation between strategy and theory. And um, I think that's my experience. Clients have to be curious about changes in the world. Uh, they have to adopt um, new perspectives uh, to understand and exploit those uh, phenomena uh, and, to, and to gain advantage. Um, so wh why do we ask this question? Clearly there's some sort of separation that says that the uh, theoretical work needs, needs justification. Um, well, um, when we talk about relevance of theory, I, I think what we're talking about in, in an applied discipline like medicine or engineering, uh, or, or strategic management is relevance to practice. And I think there's a synergistic uh, relationship in a, in a healthy discipline between uh, practice and theory, whereby uh, theory is uh, informed by practice. In other words, it targets ultimately useful questions and phenomena of practitioners. It provides a, a language for discussing those new phenomena. And it triages different explanations. Uh, Christensen talked about theory value, a concept I use a lot, which is to say a theory doesn't merely describe, it discriminates between alternative explanations and uh, uh, alternative uh, courses of action. Um, and also uh, it, it, uh, it informs um, uh, practice in the sense that um, uh, uh, it highlights phenomena, it, it poses questions and practices as a, a test bed for theory. So. Um, in an applied discipline, really, we don't need to ask this question. So why do we ask this question? Um, I carried out a straw poll 
um, in the Hyderabad meeting of the Strategic Management Society um, on the relevance of, of strategy. It's a small sample, uh, 77 participants, but it's, um, I've since uh, done uh, repeated the work with a larger sample. And um, the numbers on the, uh, on, the, on the right don't look too unhealthy, uh, except if you see that this is the percentage of respondents disagreeing with the statement. And bear in mind that this is mainly uh, academic strategists. So 81% of academic strategists in the Hyderabad meeting, I think which is reasonably representative, do not see um, strategy, strategic management, strategy research as useful uh, to, to, to practitioners. Um, uh, they, the seventy-six percent, do not see the the, uh, the strategy works being undertaken in in uh, at universities as not being based on interchange between uh, academics and, and and practitioners. Um, so I think what is in question is not really the uh, the the relevance of theory. Um, it is the connection of the world of theory to the uh, to the to the world of, of strategy. Um, so this is a. Uh, uh, I, I've looked at this as, as part of my own um, uh, profession in some uh, collaborative work with the, uh, uh, with the SMS. And I mean, it seems to me that compared to um, engineering or medicine, uh, in the learning cycle of uh, exploration and exploitation that Christina referred to, uh, we have various breakages uh, relative to those uh, other healthier disciplines. Um, one of them is that um, we have insufficient dialogue uh, between uh, the world of practice and theory, um, uh, leading, to, of course, to um, uh, an inability to work on the very latest data, on the very latest phenomena, to have a really good understanding of what practitioners are looking at, uh, and also to establish the relevance um, of, of theory in that dialogue. Um, I think we see a lot of inertia in the research agenda. If you look at the, uh, the, the, the quoted papers um, in, um, in academic research, or at least in the areas of strategy I'm familiar with, um, um, the, um, we're still quoting very old papers predominantly, and um, uh, PhD students tell me that there, is a, uh, there are obstacles to uh, undertaking completely novel courses of action. There is uh, alignment with the interests of uh, professors. There are considerations about uh, what will gain professional credit and promotion, so some sort of re inertia in the research agenda. Um, I think one of the big ones is um, potentially pursuing uh, innovation as an end in itself. In other words, when the theoreticians main audience is theoreticians, uh, there is an interesting uh, game for the theoreticians occurring, but it's not primarily uh, a dialogue with, with practice. Um, so it becomes a, an end, a sort of a glass bean, a glass bead game in its, in, in its own right. Um, I think an overemphasis on quantification, my personal opinion would be that that's a limitation. Um, strategic management is not physics, it's uh, multivariable, uh, emergent, complex systems. I think that if we restrict ourselves to uh, elaborate statistical analyses of trivial uh, propositions, um, I think we, we achieve a certain level of objectivity, but we, uh, we also lose something in terms of the usefulness of, um, of, of, the, of the theory. Um, I think that the... Um, I used to think that it was me as a practitioner that uh, that, that had a hard time uh, reading the um, uh, the typical sort of um, exhaustive statistical uh, treatment of a uh, of an of an, of an obscure area or sort of a typical uh, paper in strategy. But then I discovered, talking to my academic colleagues, that actually no, this was not a particularly good way of communicating, even for them. So I think the obscurity and the formalism of the uh, communications can be an obstacle to the propagation of, uh, of, of, of messages. And um, I often hear, I think, also a, a conflation of formality and rigor. Uh, rigor does not require obscurity. Um, and um, I, I think sort of uh, uh, formality and, 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 and logic and persuasiveness um, are, are possible with, with accessibility. It's a false, uh, false trade-off. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, I, I think if we take this sort of straw man of the trade-off between uh, the relevance of theoretical work, the rigor of theoretical work, and the accessibility of theoretical work, I mean, it seems to me that um, uh, if we take uh, uh, medicine or, or, or engineering, the claim would be that this is an artificial distinction uh, and that we really can break, uh, we can break these uh, trade-offs. We can have things which are uh, timely, relevant, uh, and 
uh, understandable as well as being rigorous. And uh, I won't go through these one by one, but some of the things we can do, I think, at the level of the Academy of Management are to get into the world. Uh, how many practitioners do we have in our meetings? Um, uh, is the format conducive to their, uh, to their participation? Um, are we soliciting them for the, the latest questions and phenomena that they are struggling with so that they can have ultimate uh, relevance? Um, are we looking at the incentives that inform the choice of, of, um, of, of, of the uh, objects of, of, of theory to ensure their eventual relevance? Are we testing ideas uh, in, 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 in practice? Um, is there a regular flow of ideas and people between, between theory uh, and practice? Or is it too easy to identify the two, uh, the two crowds? Remember that in the early days of strategy, this very young discipline we call strategy, which was founded in the, uh, on the East Coast of, of America in the, uh, in the early 60s, there was really little distinction between theoreticians and, 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 and practitioners. Um, and I think on communication, I think um, I was reminded by a, uh, a senior once of a very important uh, message, which was, I'm not in the business of uh, truth or theory, I'm in, I'm in the business of communication and dialogue around uh, around things that matter. So really, we should strive for excellence in communications. And it seems to me that any paper should be readable. The introduction should be absolutely readable. It should be well propagated. It should be well discussed. There should be a short version. Uh, there should be a LinkedIn post. There should be a tweet. And there is nothing trivial about communicating uh, clearly. Um, I think one of the key things that we'll maybe get into in the Q&A is um, Thinking about this concept of trading zones, what does it take for theoreticians and practitioners, ideally across disciplines, not within narrow disciplines, to actually communicate with each other? You have to create like a medieval trading port where people with different languages can, can actually communicate, and that's not a trivial thing. If the requirement to attend an AOM meeting is, uh, is a 30 minute presentation with full uh, academic uh, rigor, mainly addressed to people in, in one discipline, then uh, I think that the the ideas will will not travel, and an idea which doesn't travel, I think uh, we can reasonably describe as a self uh, as a self indulgence. So finally, um, let me um, uh, uh, show you that um, I'm uh, taking some of my own medicine, or at least attempting to. Um, so one of the things that, uh, uh, that that I do is to try to convene academics and um, uh, and practitioners, uh, CSOs, um, in order to have. Uh, what I call a strategy radar meeting, uh, where the, uh, the theoreticians uh, say, this is what we think we should be working on, this is what we are working on, and the practitioners, the CEOs and the CSOs say, well, you know, here are the most important issues that we don't even have a word for, here are the, here are the things that we don't understand, and we have a real dialogue uh, about uh, what, uh, what we should all be uh, working on, and uh, ideally, um, this is early days for this format, but ideally this will foster a new form of uh, a dialogue that will heal the rift hinted at uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the question. So let me uh, pause there. Great, thank you very much, Martin. Uh Wonderful, wonderful, uh, very kind of complimentary and, and, uh, and, and great to, to learn your thoughts and, and, and these ideas, wonderful. Uh, indeed, I think uh, setting us up for a wonderful set of questions too. Um, can I invite Mike, please? Absolutely. So just to explain to the audience, uh, my um, sharing isn't working. So Louise is, uh, is sharing my slides for me here. Great. So, you know, this is a discussion that I've been involved in since the beginning of my career. And in some sense, um, in some sense, I'm, I'm going to agree with, with Martin completely and, and even maybe take it a step further that it may be a little bit unfair to uh, require people to answer the question, why is your uh, methodology relevant to uh, practitioners? when the field itself is resistant to the methodology, uh, you know, it's, it, yeah, I don't, I don't sit in a lot of panels where people are saying, you know, is, is empirical work relevant to strategy, for example. So I have basically three, and, and I would like to focus on the field, but, but also bring it back a little bit to, uh, to practice. So I have three answers to this question. So let, let me give the first answer. So Louise, if you could um, advance. So answer number one is yes, uh, formal theory is, uh, is not only relevant 
to uh, generating important principles and strategy, it's a necessity. So I just um, organized an interdisciplinary conference that occurred over the weekend um, on uh, empirical design and causal inference. And it was sort of unique in the sense that it involved, um, it, it was interdisciplinary. So we had biologists, we had uh, you know people from Netflix and practitioners, we had economists, uh, computer scientists, machine learning people and so on. Um, and one of the big questions that people are asking and thinking about and in, in a big way in all of those fields is uh, how we uh, make sure that the empirical work that we do is actually accurate and has external validity. Um, from a theorist point of view, what I see mostly in our field uh, from an empirical research design um, perspective is someone has some relationship that they're interested in between a couple of variables and then they measure every variable, they, you know, they collect data on every variable they can that has any relevance or, or you know, connection to the variables of interest because uh, there's this misconception that just sort of throwing more variables into an equation is better in order to remove omitted variables bias. So you see this all the time. Um, and next slide, please. But this isn't right. So sometimes this is right, sometimes it isn't. So the structural causal modeling field in computer science, and now it's spreading all over the place, is sort of thinking very carefully about when it is the case that throwing variables into a regression equation are actually going to remove omitted variables bias. And here are some simple examples of when that would be the case. So uh, we're interested in the relationship between X and Y, and when we measure the variable Z, and these simple little graphs are intended to represent the true data generating process, uh, U would be an unobserved variable, that if you do in fact measure Z and put it into your regression, then you will remove omitted variables bias. But, next slide please, uh, that is not always the case. And here's some examples of uh, data generating systems that would actually introduce or amplify bias. Um, and there are just any numbers of variations on this theme. You can be introducing bias, you can have no effect on, on the variable, you can screw up precision. I mean, there's sort of all kinds of problems that can arise um, if you are not thinking in advance about your empirical design. Now you notice that this is very simple, but these graphs are formal objects. And the implications as to why um, you might want to include or not include a particular variable are, are implied by formal theory. So, so these are all, uh, you might argue, qualitative, but the graphs are formal objects. And there's no getting away from someone needing to think this through before they run around, collect data and start um, you know, doing regressions on things. And in fact, if they are just sort of throwing everything into their regression, I would say there's an overwhelming probability that the things being estimated are simply not correct. So in my view, and I think in the growing view of the community and econometricians and others that are working in this field, an empirical paper that does not somewhere in it give the author's um, theoretical view of the causal system generating those data and why that empirical design makes sense, um, you know, basically isn't worth the paper it's written on or the pixels, you know, pixel, pixels that it's stored on. So, you know, you could ask the question, you know, why is, you know, again, why is empirical work relevant? Um, you need to have a theory. Now, I'm not, you know, one thing that you could be doing if you have a theory like this is you could be trying to do the causal identification and actually test whether this structure is the correct structure. And, and certainly a lot of people do that. And there are a lot of methods for that. But even if you don't do that, it is incumbent upon you to tell us what your causal theory is and why these variables are being included and why they make sense. And if that's a compelling story, then you know, we have some reason to think that we should pay attention to the causal results. So I would say that you know, right out of the box, we can make an argument that, again, at least this level of formal theory is necessary to sort of make sense of anything.
All right. So the first answer is a very strong yes, and at least at this level of theory. Okay, next slide. Oh, sorry. Next slide is, by the way, there. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I, I assume that, uh, well, you will at least po uh, be posting the uh, video, if not also the slides. And these are just some citations for people that might be interested in this burgeoning work. I would, hang on, I would point out that, uh, that uh, Uta Pearl has a number of books on this that are fantastic. Uh, Jose Pinalva and I have a paper on actually taking uh, extensive form games and game theory and translating them into these objects so that you can see the empirical implications of these, uh, uh, of your uh, game theoretic model, if that's what you're doing. And there are even a couple of papers arguing in favor of this in the management literature, Lee 2021 and Lee and Bettis 2023. And I would direct you to Sinelli et al. 2022 for a really fantastic summary uh, for empirical people of these issues. So uh, that's there. All right, next next uh, slide. So the next the next answer to you know is is theory relevant it goes back to what Christina was saying, and the answer in my view mainly is yes because it it introduces novel insights that you simply wouldn't have otherwise. So the value capture stream in uh, in strategy, which uh, Joshua Gans and I summarize at least up to 2017 in our uh, review paper, um, points out that the mainstream view and strategy, the stuff that we're teaching pretty much uniformly uh, is quarter 1980, we do our industry analysis and then Barney or variations on Barney, which is this sort of VRAN idea all of which is aims to explain why are there persistent performance differences between firms uh, and across industries. And so this, this literature, and I was, I was in it for a lot of the development of it, was really a response to these economic models of perfect competition. And so the inherent sort of main idea backing these models up is that persistent performance differences require some barriers to competition. So, so what's interesting about this is that these writers um, sort of assume the premise from uh, the perfect competition models that they don't like by saying, well, you know, if there was, uh, if there were no barriers to competition, then we would see uh, sort of no profits and homogeneity and returns and so forth. So because we don't see that, it must be the case that there are these barriers to competition and what would they be? And, and we've got, you know, all of these models. Uh, next, please. And in 1996, we begin to get these value capture theory, which is formal theory and it's fairly general. And I think that's probably the work that I would be most known for um, that starts coming along going, well, wait a minute, you know, this isn't quite right. We need to think about it more. And, and some ideas start coming out that are just completely missed by verbal theorizing. So one is this very basic idea that you need to, um, think about the distinction between creating value and capturing value, that that's important and you need to think about it. The second is, is that we hear all the time people talking about the need to create value, businesses need to create value. And there's a question, well, what exactly do you mean by that? And Brandenburger and Stewart in 96 and sort of their very important pioneering paper have a definition of added value. And that seems to be an an appropriate and important way to think about how your business is creating value. And then McDonald and Ryle come along and go, well, wait a minute, you know, the, the guys that, that, that have been working in response to the perfect competition problem actually haven't gone far enough, right? So we're actually going to just reject the whole premise and note as a result of doing that, that there's good competition. So it isn't just a question of having barriers to competition because competition will eventually corrode your profitability, but in fact, there can be competition for you as much as there can be competition against you and understanding how competition for you works and you know, trying to make that uh, happen for you leads to competition actually raising your take. And so this is a sort of another idea that was just completely not on anyone's radar. And then finally, one of the other things that comes out of, um, out of the formalism is that competition isn't determinative. So we sort of have this deep, in, this deep sort of um, uh, 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 intuition 
basically from our intermediate economics of supply and demand and Cournot and Bertrand and so forth, the competition determines some point value and therefore, you know, it's fully determinative. And what this theory says is, well, wait a minute, that's not exactly right. Um, you can go anywhere from having no competition in which the participants to a transaction are just haggling with each other over what the split to be, to the other extreme where competition really does determine everything and essentially there isn't really any haggling to be done at all other than pointing out your competitive alternatives. But in general, there's probably some range of potential appropriation or value capture for a business and Therefore, when that's the case, there's something that determines how much you get within that interval, and that identifies the importance or potential importance of persuasive resources. This is, you know, again, something that is just not studied, not on anyone's radar, not thought about. So I would say that, you know, this is just an example of, of and I think there are others, but it's the one I'm most familiar with, of just a number of insights that actually are quite important, both to the field and to practitioners that arise from someone going through the formal exercise. Okay, next uh, slide. Okay, <laughs> and then this, this goes to Martin's point in a big way. Um, there's another answer, which is no. Um, and the answer is no, because the profession determines what's quote unquote relevant. So we can say, this is so relevant. This is really relevant. You know, you, you really have to pay attention. Here's all the reasons that you really need to pay attention to, uh, to formal theory. But, you know, if the field is just uninterested in that, um, it's, it's not relevant. Uh, next so I would say I've been at this for 25 years, as many of my colleagues here uh, know. Uh, and, and others have been as well. And I would say from when I started in the, the late 90s, there, there is some good news, right? So after hammering away at this for 25 years, um, you know, when I first started and into the early 2000s, a paper with a formal model in it just got desk rejected. And I can tell you, you know, it took me years to get one publication out the door. I I came into the field thinking, oh, everyone's going to love this. You know, my economist colleagues are going to be like, wow, this is so, you know, rigorous. And my strategy colleagues are going to be so happy that I'm, you know, really getting at the questions that they're interested in. And of course, what actually happened was everybody didn't like it because economists are saying, why are you looking at those questions? They don't seem interested. And strategy people were saying, we don't want to see formal models. And so it took a long time. But today... Uh, all of the mainstream uh, journals will publish formal theory, even AMR. So if you told me AMR was going to be publishing formal theory papers in the late 90s, I would have never believed it. So in a way, that's a big win. And we have a new generation of people who are pushing these methods. Um, you know, Yue, I noticed that, that you're actually on and, and uh, Lena Plaxonikovas are also people who are really, you know, working hard to continue the, the evangelization. So there's been progress, but next. Um, yeah, if you could do the next, yeah. But nevertheless, within our field, the reality is the audience for this kind of work is very small, um, especially for general theory. It's slightly better for special models that, that attend to some particular thing. Uh, Rich McAdock has a formal theory paper that has something like over 4,000 citations, but that's really the exception that proves the rule. These papers are not widely cited. They're not widely read. Uh, there's very little impact on the empirical side, and there's basically no impact on teaching or practice. So I've been teaching undergraduates, for, you know, and for an undergraduate class, you kind of need a textbook. I'm using mainstream textbooks, and they just end in 1991, you know, there, it's as if everything we discovered that we need about strategy was discovered up to 91 and nothing new has happened since then. And it's very frustrating because they're, they're conflating ideas and things aren't really clear and, you know, trying to teach from them is very difficult. Um, I would agree with Martin that uh, when I teach executive MBAs and I teach some of this value capture ideas, they are all over it. You know, it isn't hard to convince business people are always looking for advantages and new ideas. So they've all had their quarter, they've all had their resource-based view. They come into an executive uh, MBA program and they are really happy to see new ideas. But, you know, trying to convince the field is just simply very, very hard. The field is very resistant to this. So 
you know, as Martin said, why are we still having, you know, why are we still having these discussions? Um, you know, we still are. And, uh, and I, you know, I fear that, that the field is really sub-optimizing in terms of their engagement with formal theory. And that is that. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. All, uh, you know, greatly timed as well. Uh, great, great contributions, Mike. I really appreciate your thoughts on uh, formal theory and riches, you know, model and empirics. Um, you know, great, great contribution uh, as well. Let's, uh, let's move to FIBO. Sure, I'm uh, off mute. Can you hear me? Great. My name is uh, Fabio Wibbens. I'm, uh, I would, uh, describe myself as a physicist in management and today I'm going to talk about uh, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the sciences which actually is a play on a on a uh, on a physics paper from uh, from the uh, from the from 1960. Um, you might not realize it every day but actually math uh, formal and computational models really play a critical role uh, in modern life uh, maybe the clearest example is in microprocessors right like uh, microprocessors are based on semiconductors semiconductors you need like quantum mechanics highly mathematical both like very formal theory and quantum mechanics but also all kinds of simulations of figuring out what are the right semiconductors um, also for instance uh, a navigation system uh, uses actually uh, uh, uses Einstein's general rel uh, theory of relativity. You might think general relativity is something of the stars out there, like far across my field, like a really heavy math stuff. But your GPS would be completely off if it didn't make uh, the general relativistic corrections uh, for it. It would go wrong very, very quickly. Um, and also in business life, math plays a very important role. Just think of any merger acquisition or capital investment made for that matter, which uh, builds on the CAPAM, right? The capital asset pricing models, like uh, the finance people need to determine the cost of capital, what are the betas. Uh, this, this plays uh, a fundamental role in today in, 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 key, uh, in key business decisions. Um, so math is really clearly very fundamental throughout throughout the sciences. But mind you, this hasn't always been this way. Um, this actually this idea that math can do something for you in the sciences starts around 1700 in physics. So it starts with uh, it starts with Galileo and Newton. They are kind of the first ones to realize the importance uh, the importance of uh, the importance of math and and that really right before that we had aristotle with its four elements and uh, you had all kinds of alchemy and people were right there was physics there was chemistry there were all kinds of sciences but um it's uh, uh, right all all verbal and all like well it's uh, alchemy and looking for uh, looking for the philosopher's stone and like there's a really Revolution in science after Galileo and, and Newton, right? That gives rise to Maxwell, Einstein, and, and quantum mechanics, and to the world, the, the physics, and the world we have today. Um, other disciplines have seen similar formalization revolutions. E econ, right? Econ as a discipline started later, actually it starts uh, in the 1700s with uh, Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations. And uh, in the late 1800s, like there, you get the formalization revolution, while well, Ross Marshall and a couple of others start to formalize what they do. And that gives rise like to, especially post the 50s, to the capital asset pricing model that we just saw, Black Scholes, real option pricing models, right? So again, right, a true revolution. And even like these days, like disciplines like biology and medicine, right, uh, are are having a revolution. The Human Genome Project actually is like you need a lot of Bayesian modeling actually to 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 get that to work. Uh, protein folding AI. So there's there seems to be these enormous uh, revolutions uh, happening, and they're truly like I would say these are Kuhnian paradigm shifts for these fields to the point that when we talk theory in physics or in econ, it's equated with formal models, right? In physics, you would never talk about a formal model because like it's, or a computational model because like any theory is formal. Yeah, actually there's, and in econ similar, actually we can discuss whether that is healthy uh, even, I will come back to that, but certainly that is, that is the status of 
uh, those fields. Uh, in management, right? Uh, I'm uh, right. We're we're right. The field starts maybe a bit before Porter, but like uh, around 60s, 70s, 80s. We're a young field, and uh, right. If you're if you're a cynic, you could say we're still at the alchemy stage of uh, of of the fields. Um, uh, though I must write, it is important to realize, right, that Porter, but also Barney, uh, like they really built on formal theory, like in uh, uh, in econ and later, right, like Porter is trained as an economist, uh, but also, for instance, Lippmann and Remelt, 82, have uh, a formal theory paper that is one of the one of the pillars of of the RBV. Um, and I think there's an interesting question to ask, like what. Uh, why, why, why is math actually so unreasonably successful uh, uh, for uh, for the sciences, uh, including our own? Um, and I think there's a couple. There's a there there there, there there's a few reasons for it. Um, one one is actually that some uh, some people have observed it. It 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 appears that the principles of the universe apparently use use the language of math. There are some very fundamental principles, for instance. Uh, if you think about how cause and effect work, that's that's encoded in the rules of statistical mechanics. Uncertainty is encoded in probability theory. Uh, certain types of scaling laws, which are a lot used in physics, but also in the social sciences. Evolution, learning, uh, complexity, all seem to follow like all kinds of mathematical mathematical rules. And right, sometimes you hear like, okay, but well. Math that's in physics that work, but social science is way too complex. Um, I'm not sure, right? These principles are true, right? Cause and effect reasoning. Actually, uh, Christina and uh, and and Mike, you gave some great examples of these, right? How these apply in social sciences too. Uh, it's just more complicated, right? Physics, in a way, is the easy, right? Is the easy one. Uh, this is the more complicated. But Christina, right? I'm with you. This 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 is why it's fun. This makes it more fun, right? There's more more things uh, more things for us. Uh, uh, um, to uh, to figure out, I think a second really important reason why math is so unreasonably successful is that some things are just too complex for verbal reason, right? Newtonian, right? Even Newtonian physics, the certain quantum and relativistic mechanics, these are impossible to do with like verbal reasoning. You need math. Um, the cap m. Well, it's it's probably I would say is a boundary thing. I can kind of explain it to my students with very little formal things. Deriving it will be very hard, but you can kind of explain it with some analogies and with some basic principles. Um, though you need you need right one or two equations maybe. Uh, real option theory, completely forget it, right? Like there's no way you're going to derive uh, option theory, like uh, option pricing models without stochastic dynamics. Uh, and you need like solid math for that, right? It's just too complicated to verbally reason through. Competition game theory, very similar story, right? I would say, right? Like uh, things where competition dynamics, uh, probability theory start playing a role usually very rapidly get too complicated for verbal reasoning. So we need we need math, and uh, I think there's a, there's an important uh, role to play uh, for for formal models there. And um, though there is a danger, right? There is there is a clear there is a clear danger, uh, and those are in the assumptions and uh, and 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 the boundary conditions, right? Like uh, old uh, garbage garbage in garbage out. Uh, applies right, and um, any model is a model, right? It is uh, <laughs> right. The map, the map, I think, is a very apt analogy, and uh, and it's always a simplification, and that simplification is built on assumptions. And I think you could say, right? Maybe in econ, uh, there is some argument to be made that. Um, some things maybe have become too formal, and um, in a way, uh, there, there are sometimes seem, at least to my taste, there seems to be an emphasis on uh, mathematical, mathematical exactitudes without questioning actually the fundamental assumptions. Like uh, sometimes, I joke that economists have started to right. It's perfectly fine to make assumptions, but economists sometimes seem to, at least some economists seem to, start to believe that their assumptions are true, right? And when once you think that, that's uh, I think that that is a danger. 
On the other hand, I think it seems uh, I'm 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 with Mike that management still very much seems to be on the part where there uh, there could be much more room for formal theory. We've seen some uh, great uh, examples of that. Uh, one area actually where I think there's there's very important need for more formal theory is in foundations work. Uh, this is a picture I took this morning, literally from my backyard. Uh, so uh, we, we live in a new house and they're still constructing things. So I, I live in Holland and Holland essentially is built on a swamp. So, right, if you don't do this, like your house will, will like, will, 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 will sink, will sink, will sink in the swamp. So you need the foundations, but like, you might not think about these every day, right? Usually you don't see these foundations. You might even think they're pretty boring, uh, but you absolutely need them to, to, not, have your, to, to not have your house think uh, into the swamp. Um, and I think there's, 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 there's some, there can be some real issues with the foundations, uh, with uh, the foundations of manage, right? But it seems to me the strategic management field is built on some shaky foundations. Uh, as an example, right? If you think competitive advantage, rents, resource, what do they really mean? Um, it's unclear. Uh, there's all kinds of flaring up debates once in a while, and then they ebb down a bit, but they continue to flare up. Uh, up to like uh, Marvin uh, just very recently had uh, back and forth with uh, with uh, Barney Barney and co-authors on the meaning of competitive advantage, and it continues to be unclear. And I think uh, any any of the formal people here like pretty much agree that we don't know what these actually means. If you think, by the way, that you have a good idea on what competitive advantage means, I invite you to go back to like uh, this, this Rumelt paper. It's a Rumelt uh, uh, 03 paper. There's, uh, it's titled, What in the World is Competitive Advantage? And there's a competitive advantage quiz in there. Um, uh, it's, uh, I think it's a great, a great, <laughs> a great fun thing to do uh, if 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 you want to be convinced that we have no idea what competitive advantage actually means. Yet we teach this to our MBA students all the time. So I very much share, right? Like uh, Mike's, like Eric, right? Like all these old concepts we use these all the time, but they're actually unclear and unclear about the relation. That has real pr practical repercussions, right? These these are not some just some merely theoretical concept, right? But these are like very practical questions. Rely on these, right? How should you measure firm performance? Well, clearly it's not like most people use return on capital or both in practice or return on assets, even worse, right? Uh, in both practice and academia. We know like 40 years already, this is wrong. Um, but uh, so actually with uh, with my co-author, uh, Nikolai Zegelko, uh, we, we, we take a first step uh, at this question. Uh, other practical question, right? If you could make your technolo uh, technology more flexible for free, so broader use, easily, more easy to redeploy, should you always do this? Very practical question. Um, we have a model, um, a working paper with uh, Tim Volta, Teresa Dickler. Actually, the answer is no. So we have a formal model and there's actually good reasons in a competitive world why sometimes you should not do this. Um, broader question, right? What are the MISI in consulting speak, right? The MISI conditions for competitive advantage or for generating rent, um, right? In, in an academic language, you could say like, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for these? We have no idea, right? We have no idea because we don't even know what competitive advantage and, 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 and rents mean actually. Um, so I, I would say like we really need more formal theory to answer like these very fundamental questions uh, to our field. And um, so I hope with this short with this short presentation, I've convinced you uh, that we actually right we need more formal theory uh, in the field. And uh, if anything, if you ever find yourself questioning uh, of the role of mathematics in your daily lives, right? Think back, uh, think of the centuries uh, of mathematics that, was, uh, that were needed to get you to your destination when you drive your car. Thanks so much. Wonderful, Fibal. <clears throat> Thank you so much for, for, uh, for, your, uh, you know, for your great thoughts, uh, you know, very uh, thought-provoking and, uh, and, and exciting to, uh, to get you know, these thoughts together from our panelists. Um, you know, I think we've had some 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 interactions that I saw coming, you know, coming by on on the chat. 
uh, while everyone was presenting. You know, I'd like to open up to to Q and A to you know both you know among our panelists and of course also particularly you know for our um, you know for for those who are joining in for our participants here. So anyone who would uh, would like to kick off, um, please please go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, one question I'd like to pose to my, uh, while we're waiting for the uh, uh, viewers to um, put their questions in, uh, to my fellow panelists is the, the sociological theory we need to promote the theoretical aims that we all talked about. In other words, you know, what pattern of interaction between uh, researchers, learned societies and practitioners would change the game and enable the uh, the ground level theoretical work that we, we, we talked about. There seems to be missing uh, something along that, that dimension. Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Um, great question, Martin. Maybe we can, maybe we can sort of um, start with that as a thought, like, so what, what activities or, you know, how actually should, um, what can we, how can we use and, and engage with practice, if I'm translating this well, Martin, please correct me, in order to actually enrich formal theory, right? Uh, and vice versa, perhaps, as well. Anyone wants to kind of respond to that? Pick up on that. Uh, I'm, I'd be happy to take a stand and, and maybe like also like maybe have, uh, some 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 controversial ideas against uh, uh, against them. First of all, right? I think like all the idea and and like having more practitioners in the room. Actually, I used to be a consultant myself. Uh, is uh, that that those are certainly. Uh, useful, though I think like we always like to complain indeed like how bad we are at communicating with practice. I'm, I'm actually not so sure act if actually we like it, it, it clearly shows we really care about it. And the second thing I will say, right, we teach like uh, like Mike, right, you teach, right, you you teach executives, Christina, right, we all teach executives, we teach our MBA students. And to me, that is the main conduit for our research to to uh, to practice. I think that is how this happens and um, um, so so to me and yes the papers that we write are might be sometimes hard to read for practitioners and I agree we should make every aspiration for others to make them as clear as possible but a paper can also make an impact if it's if it really makes an impact with other scholars who can use this in their teaching, right? And uh, right, an engineer at Google who makes a GPS doesn't need to understand the Einstein equations, right? Um, uh, they're, 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 and, and it takes time, right? These these things can trickle down. You can have multiple levels. So that that uh, I think that is that is important to realize. And I guess I'm also happy just to follow those comments and agree with them and also a number of the comments that, that are coming up in chat. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, again, I, I think my experience with practice is that giving new ideas to business people is not a problem. Uh, business people love new ideas and especially when you can kind of ground them in, in some coherent framework that makes sense. But I would feel a lot better as a theorist teaching these ideas if I knew that they were, um, you know, not flying in the face of more general empirical work, right? I mean, it, it would, it would. I mean, the whole idea of this interaction is as um, uh, this interaction between theory people and empirical people that seems to happen in all these other fields, but not ours, you know. It is is part of the problem. So if I begin to understand, you know, if you start having this dialogue and this virtuous cycle of empirical people testing theories, empirical people finding things that theoretical people want to explain, theories being found to be lacking and having this improvement in this dialogue the way that you have in other fields, then I'd feel a lot more confident going to practitioners and saying, look, this is, you know, this is really some really solid ideas that we have here. Right now, I can say, here are some ideas that are really internally consistent and logical, <laughs> you, know, do, do, you know, and they seem like they fit to the world, but do they, you know, I don't know, I, you know, and the, and the, uh, the empirical side isn't doing that. And the other thing that I would mention is, um, and by the way, I just, you know, 
great presentations. I'm so honored to be among uh, among this group. Um, Martin's comment, um, I think it was Martin's comment about you know how how or or you know maybe maybe it was Phoebe's comment about how how physics works. So you sort of have physics. And then you have engineers that are scholar, you know, sort of engineering scholarship. And then you get the engineering practitioners. And there's a sort of bridge function that happens uh, in other fields. And here, you know, I, I think we're kind of missing that as well. So where are the people that are going, well, here's some very abstract theory that, you know, Mike Ryle or Adam Brandenburg or somebody's working on that, you know, isn't so clear why it's why it's uh, meaningful to practitioners. But you know, I'm really good at being the person who, who sort of uh, can translate that into some very practical, understandable things. Like that's what Mike Porter did. Uh, that's exactly right. He he took that structure conduct performance stuff that was being done in the '60s and turned it into a book and became famous with it, right? But and he is really good at doing that. He's 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 brilliant at it. You know, I don't know that we have those people. So it's sort of falling on us you know, the people doing the theory to sort of be the translators and sort of suggesting the empirical things and, you know, just sort of be a jack of all trades, which takes us away from, you know, what we're actually good at, which is which is doing the theory. So I think you need that infrastructure, you know, it'd be nice to have that infrastructure as well. Um, I think in my private comment to Mike, I actually mentioned that uh, Juan Alcasa from HBS did a recent survey of uh, all the syllabi, strategy syllabi used uh, across different MBA schools and actually found that the value-based frameworks is a norm, right? It's, you know, taken up by the majority of schools. So in terms of influence and impact, it certainly has uh, made a lot of progress. So. You know, you should be proud of what what you have uh, achieved. Um, yeah, I think I want to go back to maybe Feeble's comment earlier. How do we have? How have we made impact? For example, in my own teaching to MBA students, I've tried to incorporate some of my research, you know, ideas from my own research, formal and not formal, into the actual syllabus. Right. So, so if you're learning strategy from me, you're learning, I think, about thirty percent, twenty percent those content of the entire class is actually uniquely me, right? It's uniquely from Christina. So um, so in that sense, we are trying to individually make an impact, but uh, I, I'm not sure we can have an infrastructure. How valuable would that be um, that maybe, you know, help us to spread out or multiply our individual efforts because we are all not, um, we're all specialists, right? We are only good, I mean, I'm only good at uh, building some kind of uh, toy models, uh, but I'm not very good at thinking about uh, empirically testing. Um, but those people who are good at empirical testing, they may not be able to understand what the model is all about, right? So, so there is an inherent challenge um, here that we are not able to use multiple methods in our own work, and we're not probably able to to do to be the jack of all trade. Uh, that's, I guess, just the inherent challenge faced by the field. Yeah. Actually, Christina, I'm thinking, uh, it made, made me think, right, in, in, the, in the physical sciences, right, usually they have actually research, right, you have bigger research teams where actually you have like a theorist and a bit, right, that's a CERN or something, right, you have uh, uh, like on, on any particular paper, there would be theorists and empiricists, actually, that, that, uh, no, that, 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 that would be one of the ways maybe that. that that's that, an interesting that, that idea. Help. Yeah. Uh, but then we have another, yeah, sorry, Martin. You go. Uh, I mean, I think the crux of it, from my perspective, is, I mean, there are many nuances to this, but if you ask yourself, you know, what are the minimal interventions that would change the game? I mean, I think something important happens at the point when the research themes are decided. So that's, that's I think, one critical juncture. And maybe that's all about um, incentives and uh, measuring curiosity and exploration in research. Um, because the theory has a conservatism in, in, its, in its own right. You know, what, what keeps the theory moving forwards and the theory funded? And the other one is in the, uh, probably the more critical one is at, at the point of discussion. I mean, if, if, if uh, intelligent people sp and curious people spanning different disciplines of, of theory and practice debate things, probably things will get better. Things that are less useful will be deprioritized and things that are more useful will be prioritized. And so the thought experiment that I that I like to think about is um, 
you know, if at the next AOM meeting, you know, next year in Boston, 50% um, of the people there were practitioners, um, the, there were lots of CEOs there because, um, because it was a hot discussion. It was something they felt they needed to participate in. Um, that both um, academics uh, and practitioners felt very gratified and welcome uh, and able to participate. What would that format look like? Because if one could crack the DNA on that, that I, I use the word trading zone, if, if one could crack the DNA on that trading zone, that, that, that would transform the game. Because it seems to me that the, the, the conditions are extremely conducive, right? I mean, we have any number of new uh, phenomena in strategy that we don't we don't have any sort of theory for at all. I mean, you know, AI and competitive advantage. What's 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 the relationship? You know, the the um, the end game economics of AI. What's 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 the relationship? And uh, and so this there's any number of things that practitioners logically would wish to talk about, um, but unless we do something to the format, they're not going to show up to our meeting, and eventually I think that could lead to the. The decay of the discipline. It doesn't mean the disappearance of this discipline. I think when disciplines die, they become very introverted. They become very, uh, they become very self-referential. Um, so maybe another metric of success would be what would make the physicists and the mathematicians and the computer scientists want to come to this particular meeting because something very, some very sort of hot intersectional conversation were happening. I think it de definitely yeah, yeah. would be interesting to 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 have more interaction with practitioners. Though I do see one key danger, right? And I would think back, like, would would engineers have prioritized Einstein researching general relativity? Right. That's that. That, remi know. that reminds me of somebody who stood up in the Prague SMS conference and opposed the idea of having practitioners involved in the uh, SMS because the, the idea would be they would degrade the quality of the discussions. I, I think a very, a very controversial well, point. I mean, there may be a certain sort of short-term truth in it, but I mean, a, an applied discipline that doesn't connect with practice, surely that is, that is the very definition of irrelevance. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, you know, this is this is an interesting that this, you know, <laughs> nicely relays the inherent, I think, ambition and idea behind the session, because I, I think these on the one hand, there is the richness that formal theory can offer. And, and at the other end, there is, you know, the need to to remain relevant and how to boundaries span those two simultaneously, I think is a very interesting challenge. And I think that, you know, I think we're discussing some of the opportunities mm. here. Um, are there other, other thoughts on that, whether from our you know panelists or or from our participants? Feel free to come in. Or otherwise, I think we're running out of of time, Kunit, and I'm not sure if the audience has more questions for us. But I think it's been a really interesting discussion, and I'm hearing that there are issues both of the field talking to to practice, but we also have an issue within the field talking to each other, um, which I don't know which is more concerning, but they're both of concern. Uh, and I posted a comment to Martin in the chat that we're talking about doing an event um, at AOM in Chicago hosted by STR, where we would have more interaction between um, practitioners and also the academics. And hopefully that would be an event where uh, everybody would feel welcome, Martin. Um, so I see we have just one question. Tunji, you have a question before we we finalize. It has to be a very quick question. Okay. I mean, just a, I'll say comment. Um, I'm sitting somewhere in between. I've been, I'm just returning to academia after a break from practice, um, um, entrepreneurship to be precise. And I'm reacting to a comment by Michael a while back where he said, oh, it's, it, it feels like we've been talking about this forever. Like, you know, when is this going to happen? And so for me, there are three things. And this is my question. So do you think it's a question of, oh, there's some good work coming out and that is getting rejected on a so set, or that the areas of application today are difficult because all the heavy lifting has been, all the easy stuff has been done and now it's only um, difficult stuff left to do, or there's lack of interest and, um, in PhDs and in authors. And the reason I ask this is in terms of how do we get to the place where we will see the work we want to see? Do we need to talk to the editors? Do we need to talk to the PhD students? Or maybe it's just to 
the, the easy stuff has been done and it's only difficult stuff left. So that, that's what I wanted to throw at this panel if we have time. Um, so my, I mean, I'll just take a shot at a quick shot at that, Tunji. And by the way, it's nice to see you again after all these years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think the people who are editing the journals can speak to this. My impression is, is that good theory work and including some fairly sophisticated uh, formal stuff gets published in journals. It's sort of startup management science, but you can get it at STR, you know, AMR and other journals. So I, I don't think the problem is getting it published. Um, I, I do think the problem, I think there are two problems. One is, is that I, the main problem is I think that although people sort of accept that there are people that are doing formal theory, I think the attitude is sort of, you know, look, you guys go over in that corner and talk to each other. Um, you know, you, you, you know, have fun over there, but you know, we're doing sort of the important stuff over here and, and we don't have time to under try to figure out how to uh, you know how to interpret your you know whatever it is you're doing over there. So I think that I think that's more the problem um, in terms of positive solutions. I mean, one thing that I I think would be helpful would be some boot camps in this area for PhD students, and you know, and maybe even boot camps that include uh, practitioners that come in and say, hey, you know, this is the stuff that's keeping me awake at night. It would sure be nice if I had some general principles about how to deal with this. I would say that for a while I was teaching in the uh, PhD program at the University of Toronto. By the way, I'm at, at Florida Atlantic University now, so I'm not at uh, Toronto anymore. I've come to where the sunshine is. But um, but one of the things that I did, because every, all, all the students were empiricists, is I just said, look, um, here's what you should do. Write down a formal model. So, you, you know, you're going to study something empirically, but I just want you to write down the formal model. Now, it doesn't need to be solvable. I just want you to write it down. So define what the objects are. So immediately, if you've got mathematical, mathematical objects, you have to be precise. So what do you mean by competitive advantage? And sometimes I don't care what, I don't, I don't feel like there's some true definition of competitive advantage. You just tell me what it is and be clear about that and then show me why your definition matters, right? And then explain what are the agent's beliefs? What can they do? You know, what, what, what are the consequences? Like, how is the thing set up? And just write it down. I, I don't care anything. And I had all of those students saying, wow, that was one of the most useful experiences I've ever had. I mean, it really clarified my thinking. So I think there are ways that we can tackle this. But but at the moment, you know, we're off in a corner talking to each other and not to a broader audience, which needs to start happening, I think. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, for for and, and Tunji for your question. Uh, and, you know, once again, I'd like to thank the entire, you know, set of panelists and speakers for their wonderful contributions to this RSTR event.